The typical narrative around child support and alimony is that, for better or worse, the husband pays it to their ex-wives. But there's a growing demographic of women who emerge from their marriages as the payers, not the recipients of alimony and child support. Some of them have even coined the term for this phenomenon, and they joke and say it's that they pay galimony. And while no one is ever thrilled at the prospect of writing checks to an ex, Divorce attorneys report that a rising population of women are the payers and their reaction to having to support their ex-spouse is pure hot rage. Before we get into the details of women paying alimony, this new phenomenon that has been happening, this is The Legal Code and on this channel we discuss various legal topics. Occasionally we touch on celebrity shenanigans but only if there's a legal component that I think it's relevant and that you can learn from. So if you like that sort of thing please don't forget to like and subscribe and of course share with anyone else you think will find value. Also I am a real life attorney. I specialize in working with small businesses and getting a legal strategy for them whether that's whether they have to copyright or trademark their work making sure that they have the legal containers so that they can focus on being creative and making money so that is a lion's share of what I do with small businesses I also specialize in estate planning so if you're trying to figure out whether or not you should develop a estate plan then you can schedule a consultation with me there's a link in the description box within my consultation I don't hold back I give you everything that you need to do and it's up to you what you do with the information. I'm not one of those attorneys that hide behind the eight ball so that you can continue scheduling appointments with me. I give you the facts so that you can be expeditious and move on to the next task. You may not need me after that and the consultation is a way for you to troubleshoot to see if whether or not we can work together, whether you need me to continue working with you or you just need to speak with an attorney. So the consultation allows you to figure those th those three things out. Also, with that being said, I have facilitated a medical tourism trip for the many Americans. There's about 40 million Americans who are underinsured or do not have adequate health insurance. The hack that I see for that is becoming a medical tourist. There is no way the United States government is going to provide universal health care anytime soon. I don't even believe in my lifetime. And the only solution I see for that is for more and more Americans to become medical tourists and travel to different countries in order to receive their medical care. I'm not talking about receiving plastic surgery, although many Americans do that, but I'm talking about basic health care and dental care. I was a medical tourist. I've traveled to Italy, seen doctors. Doctors. I've traveled to Colombia to see doctors. I've seen doctors in Costa Rica. So this is something I've gone to, I've, I've gotten comfortable with. Because as a solo practitioner, it's expensive for me to even carry health insurance. I've been quoted at $4,000, $5,000 for a deductible before having to even see the doctor, I would have to come out of pocket. So it was just cost prohibitive for me to to even have privatized health insurance for my business. The solution I developed is to become a medical tourist. And now I'm sharing it with you after having gone through the experience. And boy, oh boy, they do medicine a lot better in other countries, specifically in Colombia. This is where this medical tourist trip is being facilitated. They do better medicine in other countries than they do in the United States. Colombia outranks the US, coming in at number 18 in the world when it relates to healthcare. Outranking the US and outranking Canada, Europeans, Canadians, and Americans are all traveling to Colombia to receive basic healthcare. I saw the dentist while I was in Colombia. Columbia. I saw a, a general practice physician just to get blood work to make sure that I'm healthy and even me traveling to abroad to receive this treatment still less than what it would cost me to receive the same treatment in the United States while getting a vacation to boot. So the, the cost benefit analysis is so easy for me, for me to be able to share with you. Even if a person traveled to Colombia for a month, did all their blood work, paid for accommodations, played for their airfare, they will still come out winning than if they would be in the United States receiving that health care. 
because it's more expeditious in Colombia. There's no administrative rigmarole. Oh, you need a referral. You have to pay this copay. You pay what you pay. You know what it is up front. There's no bill after you've received the doctor that you thought your insurance was going to cover. Yes, you will be paying out of pocket for these costs, but there's no obscurity in what it's going to cost you. There's a flat fee. You pay it. Yes, you do pay as an American, but it's still less than what you would be paying in the US as well as more expeditious. Their model is not based on 20 minutes with you, writing prescription for you and pushing you out the door. The doctors actually spend time with you, talk with you about your concerns, your medical history, your familial history. It's not about pushing you out the door and making money, which is why this was so attractive to me and to start this business as a medical tourist, because that's what's missing in the healthcare model in the United States. The doctors have to make money. It's a market driven model. So it's not about care. It's about quantity, getting as many patients in the door and out the door as possible. Whereas Columbia, it's about care. Your care is most important. The doctor will spend time examining you, speaking to you. The doctors on this roster I've met with personally, they have other nationals coming to see them. So they have experience with foreign patients. This is not their first rodeo. Many, many people are traveling to these doctors in order to get healthcare for all of the reasons I just expressed the cost, the time, the concern, the, the empathy and the compassion, which is missing in the United States. So there's a flat fee for this trip, but that trip includes all of your diagnostics that you will be able to receive, your appointments with the doctor, your transportation, any translation services that you need in order to communicate with the doctor, your x-rays, your blood works, all of that, as well as your accommodations for the two weeks of the trip. So really all you would have to come out of pocket for is perhaps your prescriptions as well as your flight. So it's a really, really economical trip because I did not want this to be cost prohibitive. So I invite you to think about becoming a medical tourist. Now, without further ado, let's discuss women paying alimony, spousal support and child support to men. What do we think about this? Rage is often the emotion after the divorce from both parties. But that's not to suggest that every divorcee responds this way. Some, especially those with children, are just fine about providing financial support. But there is a subset who do feel angry at the financial setup. Often, these are women whose husbands did not expect to be the lower earning partner in their marriage and subsequently did not take the role reversal well. Instead of stepping up at home, these men, the husbands leaned all the way back and when the marriage ended, demanded the right to maintain the opulent lifestyle that they were afforded while married. It may be a shock to some women because they're not interested in supporting men. Nine times out of ten when they will call these men losers and that's why they're getting out of the marriage altogether because he was a loser or he strayed or whatever it may be. It goes against a woman's understanding about how men are and their nature and that men are supposed to provide and protect and women receive the fruits of labor from a man that provides and protects. And when the women are doing the protecting and providing in the financial aspect, it's unsettling for women because it goes against our nature. Evolutionarily speaking, that's not to say women have not contributed. Women have always contributed, whether it's economically or in terms of physical labor. Women have always contributed in the household, but men have historically done the lion's share of the contribution. Alimony is based on the concept that a man is expected to continue to provide for the woman he married. Historically, a woman had alimony rights because she had no property rights during the marriage. This is from the time when women could not own property, had zero ability to earn money, did not have a bank, bank account. And so alimony then and now wasn't really about a woman's well-being so much as protecting the state from the undue burden of having to take care of her when her husband decided that he didn't want to be bothered with her anymore. So why does alimony aka spousal support they mean the same thing? Why does it still exist? 
Well, the modern justification is threefold. One, if a couple has children, the court doesn't think that it's in the children's best interest for the quality of life to seesaw wildly between the parents' homes. Two, a person without an income could very well end up relying on government resources such as Section 8 or food stamps or other kinds of government support. And the court does not want to do that. The court is not hot on that prospect. So the deal is you married her, you don't get to make them the state's problem just because you don't like them anymore. And the third reason is a lot of spouses, typically wives, sacrifice their earning power in order to do the bulk of the home work, um, the front labor. And so their career was penalized for which the alimony is a way to compensate them. It's sort of like their pension for the work that they put into the home and could not earn in the commercial sense. But until recently, payers could ease their pain with the knowledge that their alimony was a tax write-off. It was the greatest tax deduction known to man. But since January 2019, that's no longer the case. Alimony in now, in theory, is just a genderless thing in which resources flow from the higher earner to the non-earner or the low earner. In practice, it has virtually been given for the last half century or so that the higher earning spouse would be male. It was extremely rare years ago to see a woman who was out earning her husband. Today, it's not so uncommon for that to occur. And so for the first time in, in American history, a critical mass of women are paying their male exes support. And some of these women are making some serious money. Given the lifestyles both parties are used to, their payouts to their spouses could be substantial. It's not uncommon to see support orders that are six thousand seven thousand eight thousand even ten thousand dollars a month and i'm not just talking about celebrity women one woman reported that when she and her husband split four years ago he cleared out the house but when he left he took the television the china the flatware all of the things that you would anticipate a man would say like i don't want this i don't want that i don't care you can have it Yet she pays support and covers major bills for the children, including their tuition, camp, insurance. And so she mentioned that it's a harsh reality. And she looks in the mirror often and wonders whether this whole feminism thing has backfired on her. Failure to launch exes has been the name given to men that receive spousal support because it captures a man that was not able to provide for his family and embrace the responsibilities of manhood. Also in these dynamics, the wife is the breadwinner, but the husband is not necessarily performing the services of the traditional stay-at-home spouse. It's not just that these women are out earning their husbands, they're out parenting their husbands as well. They're out there earning money, but also have to come home and be homemakers. They're out everythinging their husbands essentially, which is where a lot of the resentment with having to pay alimony comes in because they're not doing the work that stay-at-home wives did. One woman even shared that she was just stunned that she was under the belief that she was entering like a progressive marriage between equals but she was with the man who still thought that emptying the dishwasher was a mommy thing to do. Who talks like that she said. She said she went blindly into thinking, okay, I'll do 50% and he'll do 50% and I'll be in a partnership, but it was everything but a partnership. She ended up being a single mother, taking care of three children instead of two. And it was a shock to her that she had to do everything, including earn the money. But then you also had to walk on eggshells because you can't be a threat to their masculinity. She quoted in saying, I'll never forget the moment I realized, wow, I'm making more money now and I'm still being a wife. I'm still doing all the stay at home mom stuff. I'm breaking my neck to get to the grocery store, to get to the laundry mat, to pick up the dry cleaners in time for the nanny to be able to leave, to catch her bus going to the grocery store, doing all of the errands 
that a traditional stay-at-home wife had done where the husband's supposed to be doing that role but she has to do it and earn the money again that's where the resentment comes in it's not like every woman paying their exes resents it but for those who know they've been killing it at their jobs while their husbands have dropped the ball in terms of the domestic tasks like going to the grocery store or parenting the children doing the hot doing the homework the prospect of ponying up makes these women super mad I think that might be why women have been eat, having such a visceral reaction to a man who thinks his wife only sits at home and eats bonbons and drives kids to school, drives the kids to school and then goes to PTA meetings. Women have a stronger reaction because they feel that they have done it all in the home as well as outside of the home and yet they still have to pay. Whereas the men who have to pay benefited from being the breadwinners, benefited from having a wife that stayed at home and took care of the children and raised the children and did the homework and so protected their legacy in a way. They have a sense and honor in paying this woman. Whereas women see that they benefited nothing from the stay at home dad model. As a matter of fact, their partner was a liability in the marriage and so they have a strong reaction that they got taken, they got taken advantage and scammed. In some states, marriage may not be forever, but alimony certainly will be. With an exception to Florida, which recently passed a, a law doing away with permanent alimony. But for other states, there's no limit in the length of alimony. And in these states, most states have already done away with permanent alimony. Check out my video about Florida totally dismantling permanent alimony. It's really interesting. The courts have moved away from permanent alimony and they tend to favor rehabilitative alimony for an economically dependent spouse until he or she can support himself or herself. Still even the recipient can pay his bills yet there remains a great disparity in the standard of living vis-a-vis -vis his exes and the life that he has now and so he could be awarded for many years. Even though the law is not is now egalitarian, meaning it's genderless, it's, it's equal for both men and women, it still does not sit well socially for women to set men up and bankroll their lifestyle, which is why women have such a strong reaction to this sort of financial arrangement. Having the ability to pay is one thing, having to do it is another and defies social norms and creates a psychological imbalance. This balance historically has been mentioned even in the Bible. Paul said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? This does not only mean in the Christian sense, but a yoke conveys the idea of two bulls joined to the task of pulling a plow, they are, but they are not well matched. They are unable to pull the plow in a straight line. When one is yoked to a partner, this means that two people should equally share the burdens of life. Their work will be light even when there will still be a toll and challenges because they will be striving to go in the same direction. To, un to be unequally yoked means two will be living a life in opposite direction. So the plow will be not going in a straight line. It can't. There can be no peace, no rest. The work is hard as a result and the yoke is heavy. Marriage is that such arrangement of pulling a toll. And you have to know who your partner will be when the burden of life is heavy. And just as a reminder, you can turn into this channel for different laws for you to consider if you decide to jump the broom because you should be informed. It's an arrangement. It's not a romantic idea that is supported in the, in the Western world. And so you should have the best teammate possible. With that being said, I do want to mention a few celebrities who have, a few celebrity women who had to pay alimony. Halle Berry, I'm sure most of us, most of us have heard about when she split from the model Gabrielle Aubrey. 
Holly Berry agreed to pay in the beginning of their divorce settlement $16,000 a month to support their child. Now it has been reduced to $8,000. She's required to make these payments until her daughter graduates from high school. Elizabeth Taylor, another, another famous case. Elizabeth Taylor met a construction worker, Larry Fortensky, while she was attending rehab and the actress married him, decided to marry him in 1991. Fortensky was 20 years younger than Elizabeth Taylor and understandably far less wealthy. After only five years of marriage, the two divorced and Fortensky was awarded $1 million in spousal support. Also pop singer Britney Spears, she divorced her husband Kevin Federline in November 2006. They've almost been divorced 20 years. They had a prenuptial agreement that she would have custody of the two children if they split, but Britney had a lot of mental issues and so Federline was awarded custody. She lost the custody battle and so she had to pay Kevin Federline, I believe it was $10,000 a month until the children reach, no, it was $20,000 a month to Federline for child support. Janet Jackson, who was married to her photographer, Renee Elizondo, they filed for divorce after nine years of marriage and Elizondo reportedly sued Janet Jackson for $25 million in spousal support. After a two year legal battle, she eventually agreed to pay her ex a sum of $15 million. Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold, when they split, Roseanne was ordered to pay Tom $50 million, another Madonna to Guy Richard, either it's 76 is between 76 million to 96 million she was ordered to pay guy ritchie so let me know your thoughts about women paying alimony to men if you're a man out there would you receive it i know in terms of millionaires it's it's different it's 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 different it's like they they defy the laws of nature but Ordinary women who are breadwinners who are making six figures have also been ordered to pay this amount Like I said, some of them are really making some money in order to pay Six seven eight thousand dollars a month to their ex-spouse. Let me know your thoughts about this um, It's very interesting. Do you think the laws should be egalitarian and genderless and whoever is out earning the other should be the one responsible for paying Thank you, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.